for for coming today, and uh, that's my great pleasure to to introduce uh, Dr. Alexander Gizzi, uh, coming straight from uh, New Mexico. Um, <clears throat> quick introduction for um, Alex uh, for Alex Gizzi. So he's an economic geolo geologist with a dual appointment um, as the head of the Ore Deposits and Critical Minerals Research Group an experimental laboratory in the New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources, and he's also an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science at New Mexico Tech. Um, Alex obtained his master uh, at ETH Zurich in Switzerland, and then he moved to Iceland to do his PhD, where he worked on the, on the CapFix pilot project, uh, which was the topic of the, of the, the, the talk last, last month. And then he was a postdoc fellow at McGill University in Canada, uh, starting working on critical minerals. Um, and then he, he started as an assistant professor at Colorado School of Mines from 2014 to 2020 before joining uh, New Mexico Tech. Um, basically, Alex used experimental work and thermodynamic models to understand the transport and deposition of minerals. And his Specific interests um, include hydrothermal ore forming processes and crystal metasomatism, critical mineral deposits and geochemistry of rarer elements, petrology of pegmatites, carbonates, and peralkaline rocks, and the thermodynamic modeling of fluid rock equilibria. So a lot of things going on there. And that said, it's it's all yours. <clears throat> Does that work? All right. Well, hello everybody. Uh, thanks a lot for having me here, and thanks Elvi for the invitation. I'm very excited to be here in Arizona. Uh, as you can hear, I'm from New Mexico. <laughs> Originally, I'm actually Swiss, and it's the first time I'm in, I'm in Arizona, so I'm very excited about this. Um, I'm also excited because uh, the, to talk about rare elements because they are kind of the metal of the future. The metal that are going to probably be used more and more as we use more technologies like the people sitting in the back with the computers and the cell phones and perhaps also the, the energy if we shift to alternative energy uh, like more wind turbines and, and solar power etc. And somehow during my journey when I moved from my PhD from Iceland to my postdoc in Canada I had the chance to uh, witness uh, directly an exploration boom for rare earth elements. So I've been in the field, I've been uh, with the people doing exploration, looking at the geology, and then I realized we don't know much, so I went back to the lab to actually start to do some experimental work uh, on this system to try to better understand them. So first, I'd like to give you a more general introduction uh, about what rare earth elements are and then what type of deposits we form, what they are, where they are, and then I'm going to go into the science we do um, at New Mexico Tech. So uh, first let's start with critical minerals. So critical minerals are also called critical elements because they're not all minerals, but in general we, we, we put uh, minerals and elements in there. They include mineral resources that are essential to the economy but can have a high risk of supply or, or economic disruption. And uh, there's a list of applications, it's very small, perhaps you cannot read, but these are high-tech and green technology industries. And you can see there's a bunch of those critical elements, or critical minerals here. And the ones with the highest uh, supply risk, and th that's an, an older version from Europe, the European Union, but you can see that the rarest elements on the top of the list, there, at least back then. So I'm going to focus more on the rare earth elements in this talk. And if you look at the rare earth elements, why are they interesting? So we use them uh, in a lot of components of hybrid cars, permanent magnets like neodymium in wind turbines, in lasers. It's used in medicine to image bone tissues. For example, the mineral apatite, we add some rare earth elements in there. And basically the magnetic, optical, and electronic properties make our things, uh, technology faster, lighter, stronger, etc., and more efficient. That's the key thing. So we use less energy to use those. So before I go into the periodic table, which you actually have also there, I'd like to go over the history of mining. So the global production of rare earth. We can see here in the 1950s, 
not much where th elements were mined, and mostly from, uh, I think, Brazil and India, from placer deposits, so from sediments with monazite layer, heavy sands. And then we can see here around the, the 70s, 80s, actually, um, the so-called mountain pass era. So today, the only mine of rare earth in the U.S. is mountain pass in California. And back then, in this time, 70s, 80s, 90s, the U.S. was actually dominating the production. And wha why do you think uh, they were dominating the production? Well, we had the color TV, and the color TV needed europium. So that's why there was a boom in, in, in this rare earth uh, exploitation. But we see that then we have this Chinese era from around 2000 to 2010. So most of the, the market and production is actually dominated from China. And the biggest giant mine uh, nowadays is called Bayanobo. And I'm going to talk again about uh, Bayanobo a little bit later. And then you see this little arrow here. That's when me, the Swiss guy, moving from Iceland to Canada, the, the China closed the market right then. I don't know how I was lucky for that, but thanks to this, there was the exploration boom and I had the chance to witness this whole race for rare earth uh, in, in Canada. So I had the chance to work with Crest Rare Minerals, which uh, to my knowledge doesn't exist anymore, but it was an exploration company back then exploring for Strange Lake, which is a world-class, a large deposit, and I'm going to talk about this today. And then I added the diversification area. I made this up, but uh, it's true. Right now we are trying to find diverse sources. Also in the U.S., there's a lot of funding for science on rare earth elements, and also um, more research, part of the USGS, the Geologic Survey, to better understand the resources in the United States and in North America also. Perhaps even produce more in the future uh, here in the US. So if you look at the rare earth elements, they comprise the lanthanides, lanthanum to lutetium, plus scandium and yttrium. We divide the rare earth into the light ones, so the ones here on the left, they are light and large, and the heavy rare earth here on the right that are smaller and heavier. And if you look at the rare earth market, the heavy rare earth are more rare and much more expensive. So that's also important to know. Another thing is that the properties of the rare earth is very similar, but there are slight differences in the atomic structure, or electronic structure, which make them fractionate due to geologic processes, uh, igneous processes as well as hydrothermal. That's why they're exciting to study in this rare earth deposit, how, they fraction, how can we nature fractionate them. Actually, rare earths are not that rare. So if you look at the crustal abundance, there's more rare earth than, for example, uh, the platinum group elements or, or other elements like this. But the name, to my knowledge, mostly comes because, first of all, it's rare that we find uh, ore minerals and so enriched in rare earth, like monazite, in big amounts. And also the rare earth deposits themselves are not that common everywhere in the world in comparison to other deposits, for example, porphyry deposits. So here's a world map showing the different types of rare earth deposits in geologic settings. And we have here in blue the so-called carbonatites. I'm going to explain in the next slide what it is, but it's mostly carbonate minerals. And Bayanobo. The largest, the giant deposit being mined and the world's producer of rare earth here in China is located right here and it is a carbonatite. In the US, we have mountain pass, it is also a carbonatite and the main ore mineral that we mine is called basnezite, which is a light rare earth element, fluorocarbonate, so it has fluorine and carbonate in there. And later I'm going to present you a, a geologic research in New Mexico where we also have that mineral basnezite. So it doesn't only occur in you know, a few places, but actually in many of those carbonatites, we find this mineral called bastnezite. But most people have never heard of it because the rares were not that popular, perhaps before that they're becoming now. Then in red, we see the alkaline deposit, alkaline igneous complex. And here in Canada, you can see Strange Lake, which is the place I had the chance to go and, and witness ex mineral exploration. And another project uh, was here in Nechalacho deposit, or Thor Lake, uh, which is in a more advanced stage of, of exploration and mining nowadays. And what makes these deposits more special is that they contain more of the heavy rare earths that are rare and more expensive. So a lot of people are interested now to also look into these alkaline deposits. Also, for example, Lorotzero in Russia, it's a massive 
complex. Then other type of deposits, you can see here the legend, but for example, here in Mount Weld, Australia, in Arusha, in Brazil, these are laterites. So it's a weathering, a surface process, late stage surface process that enriches some carbonatite in rare earths. And we also have deposits like in South Eastern China, which are major producers of the heavy rare earth, and they form due to clay adsorption. So we have uh, clay, clay minerals in the rock, and we have uh, low temperature groundwater that uh, reacts and puts the rare earth in those clays. And then we have other uh, special deposits like the Olympic Dam. So what are carbonatites? I thought I'd just discuss this in case you don't know. So here's an example from, from New Mexico, from the Lemita Mountains, and here's a carbonatite dike. So carbonatites are originally igneous. Uh, they have melts similar to Oldonio Lingai uh, in Tanzania. They melt almost like water, lower temperature, and they mostly form rocks enriched in carbonate. So more than 50% should be igneous carbonate, and they're depleted in silica. So the mineralogy of this rock is in general dominated by carbonates, very exotic from the Bubakite group. The rare earth mineral, we find basnezite, rare earth fluorocarbonates. We find phosphates like apatite and monazite. And we find also some exotic uh, mica, or I would say more magnesium-rich mica like phlogopite, etc. And often there is actually a, a replacement of these early formed igneous minerals. So around these igneous dikes here, we have some gabbros, and all of them here have been phenitized. So they are fluids getting out of that melt and altering the rock. And during this process of magmatic to hydrothermal evolution, these elements can be remobilized and in some instances also concentrated. So there's a lot of these different types of alteration, and phenitization is one that has been known to be closely associated to uh, carbonatites. And then, what are pearl-alkaline rocks and alkaline rocks? So these are rocks that contain a lot of sodium and potassium. So much, more than aluminum, that these elements are not going to form feldspar anymore, but we are going to form a lot of sodium, iron, or sodic minerals, like uh, egerine, which is the sodium iron pyroxene, and uh, arfetsonite, which is a sodium iron amphibole, or ribicite. And here's an example from Strange Lake, which is a deposit I'm going to focus on in the first part of this talk uh, in Canada, which is this world-class deposit. And you can see a couple of uh, images of drill cores. So here we have the granite uh, with amphibole in black and then the feldspars. And then when we move down here, we see different alteration stages. We have hematite, egerine, fluorite. And we see some igneous textures, but we see a lot of highly altered zones. So the, the magmatic processes are important, but as well the hydrothermal processes. And the question was always, how much are these processes important, and how can we detect them in the field? So just in more general, how do mineral deposits form? And now I'm focusing mostly on magmatic hydrothermal deposits. So here in Arizona, you have a lot of porphyry copper deposits, for example, you may heard, have heard about them. And here's a simple cross-section. So we have a magma emplacement at depth, we have some hydrothermal fluids like hot water exhaust from the magma, and on the surface we may have a volcano and some hot springs, like here in Iceland, we have a lot of rock alteration, or for example in Yellowstone, just to give you an example of what's happening above a magma chamber. But the main difference, number one, is we know much less on the genesis of rare earth deposits than porphyry that have been studied for many decades. The second difference is the composition in those melts and fluids. The rare earth deposits in general are much more enriched in CO2 and fluorine and phosphorus and much more depleted, I would say, in sulfur than porphyry deposits. And lastly, for example, carbonatites and actually also alkaline deposits are not just I would say, a simple intrusion. There's a lot of very complex magmatic processes from the mantle to the top of the crust, including melt immiscibility, uh, like oil and vinegar that separate, if you want, uh, a fractionation, assimilation, and other things. So they're complex systems. So the, the topic of this talk are hydrothermal processes in these mineral deposits. And the question I'm going to try to answer 
do hydrothermal fluids significantly affect rare distribution mineralogy and geochemistry in these mineral deposits? And then, if so, at what scales and can we vector these processes in the field, in geology and in geochemistry? So two case studies I will present. One is Strange Lake in Canada, which is this world-class rare zirconium niobium deposit in Quebec, and then Galinas Mountains in New Mexico. So where is Strange Lake located? So Strange Lake is located at the border between Quebec and Labrador. So that makes already things very difficult to explore when you are at the border between two states. That's like a nightmare, right? <laughs> but anyways, it's in the middle of nowhere. The only people living there are caribous and the animals and, um, and the exploration camp, you know, people doing exploration. So you can see this little exploration camp. Uh, we had to fly there. And in the camp, we had to fly around with the helicopter, and they were drilling 24-7 uh, to uh, try to describe the geology and the resource assessment and hopefully, you know, sell it for mining and figure out how to extract the rare earth. Uh, if I go back, you can understand why this mine, uh, this is not a mining site nowadays, because it's really far from civilization, and people had to think about how to ship those rare earths back to M Montreal to process them down here or build the highway this is all not environmentally friendly so it just did not happen but who knows there may be other uh, ideas in the future so we can see here work with the geologists and strange lake is a large mid proterozoic palkaline granitic rare earth deposit the indicated resource based on all this drill core and drilling was 278 million ton ore which is a large deposit Grading at 0.9 weight percent total rare earth. Do you think that's a lot? Actually, it's not a lot, right? If you would go to a carbonatite, we may have 7 weight percent or more. But the special thing about Strange Lake, about 50% of the rare earth are the heavy rare earth, the more ra rare and expensive. And then there's a pegmatite zone, which contains only 20 million tons, which is a lot actually, but they have much higher grades and a lot of zirconium and niobium. You can imagine, have you ever seen a rock with 3 weight percent zirconium? That's pretty crazy. All right, so here, this is how the maps look, the geochemical maps from drilling. So we have a set of flat-lying pegmatite sheets, and surrounding we have granite. And here we have concentration maps of light rare earth, heavy rare earth, and zirconium. And red means high, and this greenish to blue color means low concentration. So we can see right away that the pegmatites are enriched in all the three elements, right? If I look in the granite, they're actually different zones. Some of them may be enriched in light rare earth, but depleted in the heavy rare earth and zirconium. Others may be enriched in all of them. So we can see there's kind of these diffuse zones all over the place around those pegmatites. And the idea is when we started studying the mineralogy around here in this whole zone, all of the remaining minerals have hydrothermal textures and all the magmatic minerals have been dissolved, replaced, and some of the rares remobilized in the deposits. So the scales, this is around uh, 150, 200 meter or, or more. Uh, it can go up to 500 meter, half a kilometer to a kilometer. Sorry, I don't have the miles now. I have to transform that. So that was pretty impressive. And then we started studying actually the rock texture, which is very important. So here's an example of one of those pegmatites. And we can see an increased degree of alteration. And this is entirely altered. And almost all the rock is made out of rare earth minerals. Actually, the mineral was called gadolinite, which is a beryllium silicate heavy rare earth mineral. It's also one of the uh, minerals for the first discovery of rare earth in Sweden. There were these different places in Sweden where they discovered rare earth in Eterby and uh, I think it's Bastnes. So all these names come from there. So what we find in Strange Lake is that we have a lot of zirconium and heavy rare earth that are hosted in zirconosilicates, which are zirconium-bearing minerals. And normally they are very insoluble in, in hydrothermal fluids. It's hard to dissolve zirconium. That's why we use it also in igneous petrology as a vector, for example, of evolution of melts, for example. But here in this deposit, we find hydrothermal veins filled with hydrothermal zircon. So there's mobilization of zirconium. So we have rare silicates, alanite, gadolinite. We have fluorocarbonates like bastnezite and the zirconosilicates. So a lot of exotic minerals in there. 
Now, I just show one image. If we zoom in into one of those rocks in a thin section, you can see here it's a so-called backscattered image. So we shoot an X-ray on our thin section. And the lighter uh, phase are where we have more heavy elements. So obviously, we're enriched in the rare earth. And here, this mineral is bastensite. We can see dissolution textures and precipitation of this gray mineral around there. And these are maps we can do on the electron microprobe, for example, lanthanum map, yttrium, gadolinium. And it's just to show you that we have very complex relationship of uh, mineralization, dissolution, transport, reprecipitation of the rare earth, fractionation of light and heavy rare earth, etc. So if you're interested, I invite you. We have a couple of articles we submitted about Strange Lake, and, and the details are in there. So I'm not going to focus on details, but it's just to show you why um, or what is the importance of hydrothermal processes in many of those systems. So after we actually did that field work, I have this background in modeling due to the CarFix project in Iceland. That's where I learned all this thermodynamics of fluid rock interaction. So what I wanted to do is try to simulate this uh, alteration in the pegmatites and try to see how can we mobilize rare earth elements and zirconium so we can model the, f the fluids, you know, that are not there anymore. Perhaps we can find fluid inclusions, but that's what we try to simulate. And using that, we actually build a conceptual model that is also based on some, you know, more quantitative type of, of calculations. So the idea in Strange Lake is that we have this pegmatite-rich zone we crystallize a magma, so the pegmatite is similar to the granite. And then in a second stage, we start to exhaust fluids during formation of these pegmatites. And these fluids alter the pegmatite mineralogy. And in a third stage, the fluids get out of there, and they react with the surrounding granite and also transport out some of those elements. And we find evidence for all these different types of things, like hydrothermal fluoride veins, alteration halos around the pegmatites, almost like around the uh, vein and things like this. So that was kind of interesting to find out. And one of the key things I like to point out is we uh, defined this calcium fluorine metasomatism, which is basically forming this zone with high concentration of fluorine, especially in that case, hydrothermal fluoride, which we also find in other deposits like in New Mexico. And finally here to show you that we used all this field observation and then some modeling and, and combine the science with exploration if you want to understand if you can find geochemical vectors towards ore for future exploration in other places in the world. And again, I'm not going into too much detail, but what we found out is that this is a good vector in bulk rock geochemistry. So we analyzed the geochemistry of bulk rocks of pegmatites and granites in the whole deposit. This is a good vector for calcium fluorine metasomatism. So if I move to the right, I increase this amount of uh, fluorine and calcium fluorine metasomatism. And what we can see is that this alteration type doesn't affect the light rare earth distribution in the deposit. But we can see that this type of alteration increases the type of heavy rare earth and the type of zirconium uh, mineralization. So we kind of find a nice vector to get started to understand what's going on in this deposit. So the story here is that these deposits are very complicated. They have tons of complex minerals, um, and we don't know very well their genesis. And that's why we need to go through all these steps and then try to apply it to different deposits to have this more holistic view of what's going on. Now, the second deposit type, I'd like to, to give you an example here, is Galinas Mountains in New Mexico. So that's where Galinas Mountains is located. So in New Mexico, the New Mexico Bureau of Geology, uh, where I'm currently working in New Mexico Tech, uh, is assessing the potential for critical mineral resources. And I'd like to give credits to Dr. Virginia McLemore, who has been working for several decades in characterizing these resources in New Mexico. And right now, we have ongoing projects in collaboration with the Geologic Survey and the U.S. Geological Survey called the Earth Mapping Resource Initiative, which is an initiative to better map and characterize the distribution of these critical minerals. And it also includes uh, working on the geochemistry. So we sample rocks with students, we get some mapping done, and then some geochemical analysis. And if you look at the different deposit types, so we have alkaline igneous complex, 
hydrothermal fluoride pressure vein deposits and carbonatites. Um, so we have you know, the different colors here. If you're interested, you can uh, read that report. But I'm going to focus today on more the alkaline igneous complex type, which are a little bit younger. The carbonatites are Cambrian, older, so I'm going to focus on uh, Eocene, Oligocene, actually tertiary uh, igneous intrusive and the hydrothermal alteration. So this is how uh, Galena's mottets look, look like. So we have uh, some old uh, mining pits. Uh, some a bit of rares has been mined out. Um, I think 5,000 tons historically. There's also other things like base metal and a little bit of gold. Um, so it's mainly composed of these igneous dikes, trachyte and cyanide and sills. And they are hosted in sandstones and sedimentary rocks and carbonates. And we find a lot of hydrothermal veins, hydrothermal fluoride veins next to this intrusive. And we also have a lot of hydrothermal pressure and volcanic pressure pipes where most of the rare earth are concentrated. And the main mineral uh, mineralizing the rare earth is bastnezite, like we talked about in China in Bayanovo. And this is my master student, Evan Owen, who is doing his master thesis on these deposits. And I'm going to show a couple of new results we have. And it, it's not yet published, but it's exciting to see what, where we got. So first of all, here is uh, just a result from this study from McLemore uh, with the bulk rock geochemistry of these different fluoride veins we find in uh, Galinas. And we can see there's a trend of increasing rare earth with increasing barium. So we have barite, calcite, fluoride, bastnezite veins in, the di in this uh, district. And basically where we find more these barite bearing veins, we have more rare earth elements. And also we can see here the increased amount of fluorine. So if I have more rare earth, I have more fluorine. And isn't that similar to Strange Lake, where we looked at some vectors where calcium fluorine metasomatism, where it's more intense, we have more rare earths. Something similar is going on here. So now if we look at the different rocks, so we have these hydrothermal veins, hydrothermal pressure, like this is a hydrothermal fluoride pressure. So the purple mineral is all fluoride and bastnezite. And these big minerals here are all barite, barium sulfate. And here also we find some calcite, fluoride, barite veins, and different type of pressure in sandstone and limestones. And if you look at thin section, you can see this barite crystal, a closer view, they have these solution textures. And we have infills of later fluoride plus calcite. So very complex veining relationships that need to be studied at smaller scale. And on the right side, I wanted to show you one of these ore minerals, bastnezite, the rarest fluorocarbonate, because it's so spectacular. And again, we have this complex cross-cutting relationship with fluoride and calcite in thin section. Now, what we can do also with our colleagues at Colorado School of Mines, Katharina Pfaff, we did some automated mineralogy, so we can scan our thin section and then with an X-ray, and we can determine the element composition and the mineralogy. And we see here the hydrothermal barite vein with calcite and fluoride in a sandstone. So this is mostly quartz. And again, here we see one of those veins, which is likely one of the primary uh, barite, fluoride, hematite of the pyrite vein. And the key message here is that we have several generations of fluoride in purple. So we have this coarse grained fluoride, early veins. And then we have all these little veins here, cross-cutting this larger early vein. And they are filled with this green little dots, and what are they? Bastnezite. So we have several stages of fluids being pumped in and out, and there's a specific stage where we bring in the rare earth and mineralize them, and that's kind of important. So we started studying in detail the different fluoride generation to understand this. And here you can see uh, some extracts of the master thesis of Evan, uh, we did some um, mineral parachenesis and vein parachenesis, so we are looking at the textures and try to find the sequence of events. So we have these early barite fluoride veins, then we have the mineralization of rare earth once we have some brachiation, and then different fluoride calcite veins. And the key thing is here, if you move a little bit more towards one mineral, fluoride, right, the one that actually determines most of your calcium fluorine metasomatism, we try to study the textures and also cathodoluminescence. So we found three generations of fluoride. The first one, you can see it here, it's a, it's a broken crystal 
with these solution textures and, and zoning. And then we have an infill of this second fluoride generation that contains the rare earth. So that's the key stage. And then we have later fluoride, like fluoride three here, that overgrows this fluoride number two. So that's the first thing is we, we need to use cathode luminescence, which activates in the crystal certain color, especially the rare earth elements. Then what we did afterwards, we went on and selected each of the fluoride. And with a laser, we shoot it and we can analyze the trace element composition. So what you can see here, this is the rare earth composition. Um, normalized to chondrite, and here we have the different fluoride types, fluoride 1, 2, uh, and 3. And we can see this large variation in light rare earth elements. So if we think about fluoride, so fluoride is a calcium fluoride. Calcium 2 plus has a charge a little bit different, okay, than rare earth. But the ion size of calcium is very similar to lanthanum and cerium. So all our fluoride in nature should be enriched in the light rare earth, but they are not. So there's large variation. And the key of our research here is, despite the similar chemical properties of rare earth, we want to understand why do we see this variation? What do they mean in terms of the fluids, the temperature of the fluids and the chemistry of the fluids? So here I have a slide that kind of summarizes our current knowledge and where we are going. So right now, if you look at the rare earth minerals in nature, we have uh, phosphates, for example, monazite or apatite that can contain rare earth. And then fluoride and calcite are the dominant minerals we find in these veins. They can contain a little bit of rare earth and actually could be potential vectors towards these fluid rock interaction processes. So what controls the rare earth mobilization in these fluids, first of all, are the minerals. So the solubility of the minerals needs to be known. And many of the properties of these uh, rare earth minerals are actually unknown. So we just started measuring them in the last decade. Then the second mechanism is the substitution of uh, rare earth elements on the crystal space. And I made this joke with the SEG student chapter, but that's exactly what it is. So you have a parking spot uh, that has a certain size, like I'm from Switzerland, parking spot is very small, and you come with your large car, like a ram, and try to park in, that's not possible. And it's the same in crystals, in minerals. You have a certain space in that crystal structure, and certain elements will fit there, and others won't, depending on temperature and composition and other things. So we know that's one of the mechanisms that can um, control if rare earth exchange with cal calcium or not in these minerals. And then the second part are the aqueous fluids. So these hydrothermal fluids, they are all, this all happened in the past, right? Uh, but it's like, we don't know what's the pH of these fluids. Are they alkaline or are they acidic? And then we need to know about the speciation. So all the elements also in other ore deposits, they're being mobilized due to the formation of complex with ligands. So in fluids, we find things like chloride, fluoride, sulfate, hydroxyl, and also carbonate complex. So here's a little bit of a you know, quantitative calculation diagram. Perhaps you know this from your chemistry classes. But this is the activity of rare earth in a fluid, and this is the pH. And it shows the stable species, so which ligands are complexing with the rare earth to transport them. So the, wa the way this works is we need to understand the solubility of the minerals. So we dissolve a rare earth mineral and form dissolved aqueous rare earth. And then the rare earth can complex, for example, with chlorine to form a complex to mobilize it and increase the solubility and move this reaction to the right. So what do we know nowadays? I'm going to summarize this in one minute. You don't need to read all the literature. <laughs> so chloride are strong, form strong ligands with the rare earth, especially when we increase temperature. The problem is we mostly have good data up to 300 degrees Celsius and that's it. Our magmatic hydrothermal systems go even further, 400, 500, 600 degrees, and we don't know nothing about that. Just a little bit, a couple of experiments. Fluoride the same, sulfide the same. So this is all the complex that's form in acidic fluids up to 300. That's most of what we know. Then hydroxyl complex, we know nothing. We only have 
room temperature data, we have nothing at high temperature, that's why we need to do some experimental work to determine this. The carbonate complex, there are two studies that just came out last two years that actually indicate importance of carbonate complex in high pH fluids. So there's still a lot to do, that's what I'm trying to say. I'm not going to discredit all the hard work that has already been done on the rare earth. This is pretty amazing, but we need more to really understand these systems. So that's why I uh, started this new ore deposits and critical minerals experimental research group and research lab at New Mexico Tech. Right during the pandemic, I moved there. That was good timing. Uh, very hard to build up a lab, but we are, we are there. And it's already filled with postdoc students, undergraduate students. It's very vibrant. We do fundamental research. Everything is right now is funded on the rare earth, so we are very lucky by the Department of Energy, National Science Foundation, and also New Mexico Tech. And we also do thermodynamic rolling, experimental work. And, you know, a lot of the work we're doing is with the students and the postdocs. So I'm going to give you three slides, summarize everything we do in three slides, which of course is too short. But you may perhaps see some future talks with more details or visit us in New Mexico Tech, and I will be happy to show you more. But here is an example of what we do. So we do spectroscopic experiments. So we have a window into high temperature pressure fluids. Here's an example of a UV vis, so we use UV light, and we shine it through these different uh, water chemistries with different amounts of rare earths, and we can measure this spectra in situ at high temperature and determine what is the speciation. Another part we have here, we just got a new Raman, Nicole Hertig, Professor Nicole Hertig is uh, the main PI on this Raman, and we have new, a new hydrothermal diamond anvil cell where we press two diamonds and we can create high pressure and temperature deep in the crust where we have close closer to those magma sources to understand what's going on in these fluids. Then the second type of experiments, which is very hard. We produce three data points in one and a half years. Who wants to do that? <laughs> we are crazy enough to do it. But it is exciting because we start to learn a lot about this rare earth. And I have this PhD student, Yeko, he's working on this. And we actually do calorimetric, hydrothermal calorimetry. So we have a high temperature calorimeter that we can rock and we can dissolve some minerals and measure the enthalpy. We also do mineral solubility experiments. My PhD student Kevin Padilla right now is measuring the solubility of a lanthanum uh, in these hydrothermal reactors. In here are a couple of images of synthetic crystals we use also to measure the solubility of rare earth phosphates. And then the last slide, um, this is actually also very exciting because here we are synthesizing minerals in the lab. So we have a hydrothermal reactor and we pump in a fluid and mix two fluids at high temperature. Right now we are working between 100 and 300 degrees Celsius. And we synthesize, for example, this calcite rhombohedron. We dope them with rare earth elements. And we can measure the fluid in situ and we can measure the rare earth concentration in the calcite after the experiment. And with that, we can build new models, like this lattice strain model and other thermodynamic model to actually simulate how does the rare earth concentration change in these hydrothermal minerals as a function of pH, as a function of temperature, etc. So we do all these experiments, but what do we do afterwards? That's the next step. So it's a lot. We do field, we do the experiments, but that's the key link. And now we do the modeling. So uh, I started developing this uh, during my PhD in Iceland with Andrew Stefansson when we started working on basaltic rocks. And then I continued this when I, I became an economic geologist and working on ore deposits. So this is a thermodynamic database available for free. So everything we uh, get in the lab, we put it online for free. It's open access. We also have uh, tutorials, so I made a Git book, and we also do workshops to teach how to do modeling of fluid rock interaction and ore forming processes. And right now we have a database of all the rock forming minerals and most of the major AQ species at high temperatures and pressures so far from what we have. And we also have a comprehensive, or I would say probably the most comprehensive data set for modeling rare earth elements and other critical minerals, and also base and precious metals, like you may have in porphyry or base metal deposit, Mississippi Valley type deposit. So we try to simulate a lot of different deposit type 
And we also collaborate with people working on different ore deposits to validate this database. And now I'd like to share an example. What do you do with that database? So this provides the key link between experiments and field observation is this fluid rock interaction modeling. So we use the GEMS code package and the MINDS thermodynamic database. And I just want to show you a simple example from Galinas Mountains. So you remember we had this barite and calcite vein and then it's replaced by fluorite and basnezite. So we are trying to simulate this replacement of calcite by these two minerals. So how the model works, we just have a box filled with a calcite vein and on the left we inject an acidic fluid that contains rare earth elements and fluorine and we react it and then we flush it out and we pump in a fresh batch of fluid in, out, in and out and then we look at the alteration of this box. And this is how this looks like. So we can model the pH of those fluids at high temperature, 400 degrees Celsius. And we can see how the pH changes upon fluid rock interaction. Here it's going down. So this is increased amount of fluid pumped through that box. And here we can also see the stable mineralogy. So initially we have the calcium vein. And then when we inject an acidic fluid, we dissolve the calcite. It releases some CO2. And CO2 plus fluorine plus rare earths is the good ingredient to get bastanzite and calcium flu plus fluorine is the good ingredient to get fluoride. So we dissolve calcite and we progressively form more fluoride and bastanzite, which was the main ore in Galinas Mountains. So it's a very simple model, but just to show you the concept. Now what is special in this model, what we do for the first time, is to mold the rare composition of those fluoride, which is not easy to mold. So on the right side, we can see the mole. Here is the different rare, are the different rare earth elements normalized to chondrite. And we can see there is some variation in, in the moles depending on fluid rock interaction. So that's the first thing. The second thing is if I compare this to the natural fluoride we measured in Galinas Mountains, we can see that orders of magnitude here, we are very close to what we found in nature. So that's already not that bad, right? But moles are always moles. They are simplified uh, moles to try to understand the natural system. You can see some of the heavy rare earth variation is what we see here in the mole. And finally, this light rare earth variation, we cannot reproduce them. So our mole failed, which is not bad because the mole is not yet uh, built based on our new experimental work. So we are still developing this to be able to simulate this much better and then we will be able to say things like about temperature and fluid chemistry. So I'm very excited about this. This is new and very, very few if no one is actually doing that worldwide. So we are very excited about these results. Finally, the last thing is to, to show you a little bit the teaser. We're also modeling more complex system, adding also some hydrology component if you want. So here's an example of a one dimensional reactive transport. This time, instead of one box, we want to be like in geology, we have a series of 50 boxes and we inject that rare earth fluorine rich fluid on the left. And the more the time passes, the more fluid went through all the rocks. And this is after 200 steps at high temperature. We start to replace calcite with a bit of bastanzite, a bit of fluoride. And then after 2000 steps, we start to form a big zone enriched in fluoride. Uh, we have a big zone enriched in calcite and bastanzite and a smaller zone where we may have a, a vein with bastanzite and fluoride, which could be similar to what we observe in Galinas Mountains. So going back to our natural system, that's the key. Just modeling in a black box is not very helpful, so we need to go back there and try to see if we can use the model to understand the natural systems. And again, this is work in progress, but it's just to show you we find different zones where we have calcite fluoride, others where we only have fluoride, other zones where we have bastanzite and fluoride, and we see also dissolution textures and precipitation. So if I go back to the model, we can try to see if we can reproduce these different zones we see in our rock. So, I don't know if I'm too quick, but uh, the important thing here is a conclusion. So we have a, a strong interplay of magmatic and hydrothermal processes in all of these deposits. I focused mainly on the hydrothermal aspects because that's where we are specialized in, but don't forget about both aspects. 
we start to simulate the composition of earth composition uh, the, the composition of earth minerals but again the, the natural system are complex and we need uh, much more experimental data to really be able to simulate what's going on and make an interpretation of the mineralogy and geochemistry of the rocks also if you want to ha help for exploration for example and then the last part is the aqueous complex. We don't see them, right? But they're in the fluids. They're extremely important to transport and mineralize rare earths. So we know a little bit in acidic condition, a lower temperature, but not at very high temperature in supercritical fluids. And we don't know much actually in alkaline fluids, which may prevail in carbonatites. So to finish up, i like to thank all my collaborators uh, that are here at New Mexico Tech, also in Europe, um, in the Bureau of Geology, all my graduate students, the postdocs, without whom we couldn't do that work all together, uh, and also undergraduate students who participated, and of course, the funding of the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, SEG, Society of Economic Geologists, has helped also uh, to fund students uh, to do some field projects, and the New Mexico Bureau of Geology. And I'd like to thank you, Hervé, for the invitation and everyone for being here. Do you have any questions? <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you, Alex. Very uh, interesting talk, Thanks. very interesting work as well. Um, <coughs> do you have any questions in the audience? Excellent talk, thank you. I have a couple questions actually. Um, the first one is, so the numerical modeling that you showed initially, that's from your PhD work, I guess? The uh, no, that was my postdoc actually. Oh, yeah. the postdoc work. Uh, just out of curiosity, so um, do you incorporate kinetics in there? Like are the diffusivities of these elements well constrained? Yeah. Or? Uh, okay, so, well, in aqueous geochemistry, the, the kinetics normally involved are very low temperature, where we are looking at precipitation and dissolution rates and surface reaction. So the idea is in this hydrothermal, you know, low viscosity fluids, the, the reaction would be very fast and we would approach equilibrium or like full reaction. And that's the main assumption in this type of model. Okay. Uh, I know that in metamorphic petrology and igneous petrology, um, you know, people also work on trace element diffusion yeah. and things like that, and these are very interesting, but we are, we are not even considering this in, in this model, for sure. Okay, and the second question is about uh, carbonatites. You didn't really talk about that in, the, in here, but I'm just curious, like, you showed, like, how, like, the calcium can easily substitute rare earth, so, like, when it comes to carbonatites and associated RE deposits, are calcium carbonatites preferred over, let's say, sodium carbonatites, or is there some link there? So I think I'm not an expert yet in carbonatites, but I'm very excited about them, and to my knowledge, the calcium carbonatites are the most abundant, and also if we have a carbonatitic melt, so people have tried to measure fluid inclusion in those carbonatites, and they're very complex. So some are not even aqueous, like water, but some are like salt melts, uh, and then we have carbonatite melt. So my knowledge is that if you have a carbonatite melt in the hydrotherm aqueous fluid, the uh, rare earth and all that will probably prefer to stay in the carbonatites, but once they crystallize and these fluids react, they're going to dissolve and remobilize those rare earths. So there's a little controversy going on now in the community, like is it magmatic, is it hydrothermal, which mm. one is the most important? I would say definitely the magmatic processes are very important for initial enrichment and then placement of this uh, rare earth and, and other critical mineral enriched zones. But then a lot of the carbonatite or all of them have this metasomatism going on around it. And we don't know much how important it is and how far it affects um, the overall rare earth distribution. So I think we need to study these carbonatites from the melt origin to the evolution of the melts to the hydrothermal evolution stage in the field, and then you know experimentally, and 
have like this holistic approach and different approaches from different groups and then come together and build a model. And they are difficult. Like how does a carbon attack form? There's so many different, well a couple of different ways yeah. that people explain it. Yeah. But okay. Very good question. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? <coughs> If you don't uh, like the microphone. <laughs> uh, so great talk, yeah. Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. I, I'm curious about if if any of the experiments that you've done related to the dissolution and reprecipitation of REs could have an implication for the mineral processing, um, because that's uh, that's from my understanding like one of the biggest issues with Mountain Pass, for example, is that we don't we don't have a good understanding about how to even process these minerals even if we find them. So yeah, uh, so I'm not a metallurgist but there's a big interest. The fundamental research we do has a lot of different application including you know mineral exploration, geology, but actually also mineral processing because we measure the stability of these minerals, we measure Gibbs energy, entropy, so we measure energy and energy is money for processing, right? And, th and that's the major problem. So there, there may be, you know, uh, implication, and we may also make new discoveries, perhaps of, of better ways to try to separate uh, eff efficiently the, these elements. And there's a lot of different groups that try different methods. So one may be like clay adsorption, or the uh, process could be hydrothermal separation. But again, we need to heat up, so it may be more expensive. But if it's worth it and we can do a lot, it would, you know, it could be possible. The major problem of these different rare deposit types, especially the alkaline deposits, is they all have a lot of different types of exotic minerals. So they're very complex. And for example, in Strange Lake, they had to uh, develop their own processing technique. So they shipped all the ore, had specialists, metallurgists doing different tests, and at the end had to prove there is a, a good way to separate them. One of the big problems is environmental aspects which are part of mining and that's also uh, to my knowledge something China may be worried to, to process too much and then have some environmental issues um, so it's not easy to separate them and we need to find better ways so it's exciting times and I think there's still a lot to, to discover to, to improve processing of not only rare earth but other critical minerals so yeah very good question Any question? <coughs> well, I do have one or maybe two. <laughs> um, yeah, you were mentioning that you have these um, those carbonatites, for example, and then you <coughs> you want to understand the magmatic processes, but also the hydrothermal processes. I'm just wondering: is when you talk about fluids, do they need to be related to the directly to the to the magma, which is which is cooling and absorbing some fluids, or you can have those rocks which are here and then I don't know, um, 100 million years later you have like superficial fluid that can remobilize easily those, those rarest elements. So. Or both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, m mostly what we can see, at least from the examples I've seen in nature, is that the hydrothermal, that's why I talk about automatism because we have a magma and at some point it exhausts some fluids and these fluids react with the existing crystallized rock coming from the same magma. So there's a lot of this automatism going on. The major problem that would argue against later meteoric worms and such, which it can happen, you know, where we form laterite and things like that. But uh, if we measure, for example, in the lab, the solubility of rare earth at room temperature to 100 degrees, and we do the same and increase the temperature to 400 or 500 degrees, we increase the solubility of rares by like four orders or more or magnitude. So it's much more efficient to mobilize those elements at high temperature in, in fluids. And the same if you had chlorine in there, we need to have the ligands and the rares to be able to bind and to be able to transport. So what we know is if increased temperature, the water molecules are pushed away and then the chlorine are going to cluster more around those rares and take them and you know dissolve and transport them. So these are the things we are trying to study at the molecular level because we don't know much in high temperature 
fluids. And again, fluids are different things for different people. Uh, I'm talking about uh, hydrothermal aqueous fluids, uh, not melts. And then carbonatite melt are even something on its own. Strange okay. melts. And I have a last one probably. Um, <laughs> Yeah, how do you envision all the work you are doing and uh, all this great work, uh, how it could be used by, I don't know, exploration geologists? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. So right now we, we have um, you know, this big group of people working on rare earth, so we are gathering the experimental data. Uh, we are building up a big experimental database with what we produce, what exists. And then we are developing some larger model to be able to simulate this uh, using thermodynamic models. The first step is to put all this together also for the community. But then the, the second aspect is really to apply it uh, to different deposits in the field. We will do some of that work, but we also want to work with other people doing this work because the force is in numbers. And, and then we, we interpret the field with the modeling and compare these different deposit types to see commonalities for uh, mineral reactions, geochemical changes, and then the idea would be really to, to present some type of uh, vectors that can be used for exploration. So we know what the industry is doing in the field, the data they gather, but the idea would be to give them better information to analyze the geochemical data. So do data analysis, not just plot X versus Y, but perhaps find some new types of ratios and things that could help once they get all this data to drill less, uh, uh, understand the structure underneath the subsurface in a quicker way. Mm. Very tricky because we do this fundamental lab research and then getting out to all this, it's a lot of steps. So very good, yeah. Thank I you. I hope we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. But I guess we can continue uh, the discussion outside uh, around snacks and drinks. And I would like to uh, give you uh, another round of applause. Thank you.